Marami nagtatanong po, no? Would the United States actually go to war over something like this? To be blunt about it, Ambassador, the Chinese do not have any business being in our exclusive economic zone. Shouldn't that be the starting point? You're really pushing it, Christian, but I can tell you that clearly, we are not happy with what they're doing. Magandang araw mga Faxnatics. Uh, welcome po sa ating very special episode ngayong araw ng ating Fax First Convos or Conversations. So for this episode, kasama po natin ang ating uh, ambassador, the Philippine ambassador to Washington, si Ambassador Jose Manuel Babe Romualdez. We'll be talking about a lot of issues, of course, uh, centered and revolving around the issue of the West Philippine Sea, kung saan paulit-ulit po tayong binubuli at hinaharas ng China. Magandang araw po, Ambassador Babe, and thank you for yeah. joining us in this well, Fox Convo. I finally get to see you in person, Christian. Yeah, finally in the flesh, Ambassador. Uh, yes. Sir. Kumusta po? I, I suppose you're very busy because of the visit of the uh, State Secretary. Well, yes, uh, we've had a number of uh, visitors here. As you know, before that, we had uh, Secretary Gina Raimundo, Commerce Secretary of the United States, who was here with 22 uh, businessmen. So that was very significant. And before that, we had the U.S.-Philippine Society Board that uh, comes here every year. So a succession of, uh, of visitors uh, coming from the United States uh, gives it uh, that emphasis on how important our relationship is right now with the United States. So. Speaking of this very important relationship between the Philippines and uh, Washington, a description, latest description is hyperdrive. Mm -hmm. no? Is this hyperdrive relations between the Philippines and the United States driven mainly by the threat of coming from China? Well, you could probably say that, but we've had this relationship with the United States. It's, it's a, they say touch and go, up, up and down. But at the end of the day, they really are our oldest ally. And because we have a very strong Filipino-American community in the United States, every other Filipino has a relative uh, who actually lives in the United States. That kind of relationship uh, has, has, has been there for such a long time. Now, it's only rekindling it with, with all of these challenges that we all face right now. And, and right now, obviously, the challenge we have in the West Philippine Sea jibes with the national interest of the United States, which is also our national interest. So, taman tama yung pagsasama natin ulit na strengthen our relationship with them at this time. Let's talk about the timing and the message of that visit by Secretary Blinken. And of course, may follow-up ito, no? Magkakaroon mm -hmm. po sa April 11 ng Trilateral mm -hmm. Summit to be hosted by President Biden. So dito, let's talk about the timing. Why, why, why the visit of uh, the Secretary of State, si Anthony Blinken, sa Manila? Well, Secretary Blinken has been planning to come to the Philippines uh, as a, as a follow-up to his first visit here. If you remember, he was here uh, just a couple of months after President Marcos uh, took over the presidency, and he did promise that he wanted to come back here to not only to be able to 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 see where our relationship is as far as our defense strategy is concerned, but also on the economic side of things. So the perfect timing was the fact that Secretary Gina Raimundo came here, uh, a, a presidential delegation which uh, was promised by President Biden to President Marcos when he went there last May. Uh, that was really a, a follow-up with, with Secretary Blinken, who happened to be also around the area. So it, it, the timing just went perfectly well for that. Your reiteration, sir, no, no, ironclad support coming from the United States when, it's, when it comes to the Philippines. How important is that reiteration, given the realities that we're seeing now in the West Philippine Sea? Well, it gives us a lot of comfort to the fact that uh, because precisely of the challenges that we face, the United States has made it very clear that their uh, their commitment to the mutual defense treaty is not only ironclad, but I think it is uh, it is something that is is seriously and more emphatically being uh, told to us that they will be there if and when the time comes that uh, we call upon them uh, to help us in our defense strategy. Uh, hopefully, of course, we, well, we are hoping that it will never come to that. But th the point of the matter is, is that this relationship, as I've said, we've had it, uh, this defense treaty, we've had it since 1951, is now uh, the wisdom of our uh, leaders in the past, in the 1950s, is now being is, is very useful for us at this point in time when we need our friends, not only the United States, but other allies as well. So to protect us, uh, uh, the ter our territorial integrity, and uh, to make sure 
that like-minded countries band together into uh, pushing back on any aggressor. Do you think that's the main thing that's stopping China from pushing further in terms of harassing our Well, troops? you know, for us, what is important is that uh, we, we simply are really just uh, reiterating what we've already said from the very beginning, that our territory is non-negotiable. In other words, we want to protect our territory. If we did not have this problem, our relationship with the United States will continue as it is, but it will not be as intense, precisely because of the intensity of the, of, of, of the situation. We have decided to really strengthen that relationship with the United States and other allies as well, to precisely uh, give a message to our friends in the North that uh, we're serious about this. Mm -hmm. We want to sit down and have a peaceful negotiation or peaceful uh, a conversation on, on all of these things. But for us to be, uh, to be, to stop us from even supplying the, uh, the Sierra Madre, for instance, and all of this, uh, all of these activities that are happening there, the harassment uh, is, is, is unacceptable to us. And the Filipino people have spoken. Mm -hmm. uh, a majority of our people have already clearly said that they, uh, they certainly are, uh, are unhappy with what's going on right now. Uh, in fact, the recent survey also shows that even 75% of our people are ready to, to stand up and fight if they need to. But we're, we're praying and hoping that this does not have to come to that. Yeah. We, we just want to be able to, to tell our neighbors that we want to be able to talk peace. We want to have peace and stability in our region. We're talking to other claimants mm -hmm. and we're having a good conversation with them. And all of them agree that we, we can talk about all of these things, the overlapping claims in the territories. Ito ironclad support coming from the United States and then they keep reiterating the 1951 Mutual Defense Treaty. But how far do you think the U.S. would go to protect or defend the Philippines? Well, I'm going to tell you this. Uh, I haven't been in the United States for some time now, and uh, not only as the ambassador, but even before that. I have never seen the seriousness of our relationship in the, in the sense that the, everything is being... Uh, all, all things considered, uh, both sides of the aisle, meaning the Republicans and the Democrats, all are together with us when it comes to our uh, to the arbitral award that we were that we are given, and that they are definitely against any kind of aggressive behavior coming from China. I'll ask about something very specific, no? because uh, see, Secretary Blinken actually mentioned in his statement, including those of its Coast Guard. So, we say, pag ginalaw yung ating Coast Guard, uh, nagkaroon ng armed attack, no? We don't want that to happen. But no. if that happens, marami nagtatanong po, no? Would the United States actually go to war over something like this with China? You know, going to war is probably um, uh, not the right word for it. The United States will make good their commitment to us. That if in the event that any one of our like the Coast Guard, for instance, is harmed or anyone gets killed or anything, that is that is enough to for for to the invocation of the of the mutual defense treaty. But we're trying to avoid that completely. We we you uh, what what uh, our defense department has said we do we're using maximum restraint mm. in every way we can because we're still hopeful that uh, our friends uh, or uh, our neighbor to the north will come to their senses, that there, there is no need to go into this aggressive behavior. Mm. But we will continue to do what we're doing, which is to supply uh, our soldiers who are uh, in, in, in the Sierra Madre, in the Ayugan Shoal, and, and for the rest of the other territories that we feel is, is within our rights. So far, given the realities now, because China is actually pushing the envelope, but within the bounds of what is acceptable before that escalates into an armed attack, po, no? Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the the water cannon attacks mm -hmm. on our vessels. Ano bang plano po dyan? And how exactly can we, uh, what kind of help can, can we get from our allies like right. the United States? Let's not speculate on how, what kind of help. The bottom line really is, while we are praying and hoping that it will never come to that, but if it does, for me and for many of our uh, countrymen, I think we can be uh, assured of the fact that the United States is not going to back down on their word. Okay. And I, I'm, I'm quite comfortable with that one 
because every single day that I am in Washington, D.C., and every meeting that I have, it is a serious concern. It is something that the United States, uh, I've never seen this type of uh, attention that is being given to this type of uh, situation that we're in right now. Uh, not only be, uh, manifested by all these visits coming from high officials, but the fact that we are continuing to have conversations on how we can avoid any real conflict, but at the same time being firm mm. with our commitments for the Mutual Defense Treaty. Mm. But how about in terms of dealing with this uh, gray zone tactics of China? It's well, very pesky, and actually the last incident injured uh, a number of Filipinos. That's true. Uh, that, that is why you know President Marcos is, uh, is obviously very concerned about all of this, the escalation. Also, we're, we're finding ways and means to be able to de-escalate it. Now, one of them, of course, is that we've... Uh, I think uh, we've already started our our conversations with uh, the Chinese government. Uh, we've had uh, our undersecretary uh, go to Beijing, and we're hoping to have them to come here. And we can start uh, in small steps. We'll take small steps towards a a resolution that will be acceptable to both parties. How about the threshold or baseline for any discussion? Because I got to be blunt about it, Ambassador. The Chinese do not have any business being in our exclusive economic zone. Shouldn't that be a very should that shouldn't that be the starting point? Well, uh, you're you're really you're really pushing it, Christian. But I can tell you that clearly, we are not happy with what they're doing. Oh. So so to begin with, we're pushing back. Oh. We were always in the mode of trying to appease them. We're trying to say, let's talk, let's talk. And right now, we are very firm. We will continue to do what we're doing because this this area is our territory. Mm. At the same time, we're offering them, let's sit down. Let's not bring it to a level that is uh, going to make it uh, escalate it into a, a major conflict. Mm -hmm. And I think the message is very clear. So we, we're trying to find ways and means to be able to really uh, come to terms for both of us, mm -hmm. for both our countries, that we, we need to sit down. It's not about the United States. It's yeah. not about the competition. It's about what is, what is rightfully ours. Mm -hmm the rule of law, the international law that has been, uh, the, the uh, arbitration award that was given to us. Mm. It's, all, it's about that. This is where our argument starts. You recognize that, they're a signatory to that one, then, that, then we, have, uh, we have at least a direction where we're going. But unless that, that thing is uh, recognized, then obviously the, the situation remains the same. Yeah, let's talk about the, the nuancing in terms of China's messaging or gaslighting. Mm -hmm. well, this is the latest visit ni uh, Secretary Blinken, sumagot yung Chinese Foreign Ministry. Mm -hmm. Sinabi nila, the United States is not a party to this issue. Tapos sinabi rin na, he has no right to intervene uh, in the maritime issues between China and the Philippines. Hindi pa parang sila nagpapasok sa US equation instead of the Philippines doing it? Well... As the Defense Secretary uh, Gilbert Tudoro said, they have no business telling us what to do. Do we tell them what kind of relationship they should have with North Korea or Russia? Obviously, we're concerned about that because of what's happening, but we're not telling them anything. They shouldn't tell us either on what kind of relationship, who we want to be friends with. It's as simple as that. I mean, if, you know, if we, this, we have a relationship with the United States, we have a defense strategy with them, it's our business. It's as simple as that to, to, to many of us. We believe that that's the way it is. And, and I think Secretary Tudor said it right. They have no business telling us what to do. But why do you think China is so brazen in terms of framing the narrative this way? Well, uh, you know, it's, it's very hard to explain many of the actions that they've, they've, they've taken. Uh, in fact, I'm sure you've, uh, you, were, you heard about uh, the Gulf of Tonkin which they're now ex expanding their uh, so-called territory. That is a problem, of course, that uh, our, our ASEAN friend, uh, Vietnam, is facing also in their area. So uh, w it's, it's something that we're trying to still decipher and wh why they're making all of these moves that obviously is not helping them in the international community. But uh, for us, we just want to be able to, to leave it at peace do not harass us, do not uh, try to take over any of our territory, then we have no problem with you. For as long as they continue to do what they're doing, then we have a problem, and we will continue to push back. In terms of our ASEAN neighbors, of course, 
matagal nang iniintay na diyan. I don't know how effective that would still be. Yung uh, legally binding code of conduct. Although we have an existing uh, declaration in the code of conduct, but it's not binding. I mean, how are we in terms of also getting our ASEAN allies on board to fight for what is right in terms of uh, international law? Well, I think the president has, uh, has made it clear that he is reaching out to, uh, to the, the same uh, claimants, uh, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, and, and Brunei. Brunei. So he has reached out to all of them. And I think uh, in many of those conversations, at least especially with Vietnam, we all are agreed that we have to find a way to be able to work together for our maritime security and maritime uh, uh, in our, our environment to be protected and that the fishing, uh, to regulate fishing. Th these are all very important uh, issues that we have to uh, we have to band together, especially those that are uh, with competing claims. But you see, the beauty about it is that we have all of these neighbors that are ready to just simply sit down and talk about this and to find ways and means to be able to have a resolution to it in a peaceful way. Not the way that is being uh, thrown to us by this type of aggression that this is ours and you have no choice. You have to ask our permission and everything. That's totally unacceptable to any one of these other countries. Mm -hmm. So we're together in this one. Oh, incidentally, yun ang in China kasi. Exactly. Diba? That's why. But mm -hmm. in terms of dealing with that particular tactic, so, of course, I don't, you don't have to talk about the specifics, pero what kind of developments are happening in that front? All I can tell you is that uh, because of... Uh, the multilateral approach that we're doing right now, uh, especially with Australia, Japan, and the United States, and some European countries. Uh, I, I think that um, clearly we have options that are now available to us. And more importantly, uh, we have many of our allies that are prepared to work with us into finding ways to be able to secure our borders, uh, the territorial waters that, we, uh, that we're uh, uh, fighting about. But but uh, people have the wrong notion that if we, if, we, if we just stay away from these two countries, we'll be okay. Yeah. That's, that's totally uh, being uh, naive about this. The reality is uh, anything happens to any one of our countries in the ASEAN region, all of us will be affected. Mm -hmm. And this is the message that we tell all our ASEAN neighbors. If anything yes. happens to us, Lahat tayo apektado. Uh -huh. Japan realizes that. Australia, which is so far away, they know that this is, we're in the front line, so to speak. Island chain yan eh. yeah. So nobody will be, will be uh, immune from this type of uh, situation. So we have to work together. Kailangan magsama-sama tayong lahat to be able to make it clear na hindi tayo, uh, hindi tayo we're not going to budge. Kasi yung, sa atin, we're arguing on the basis of kung ano yung tama eh. yeah. You see? We're not arguing on the basis of what we think is the historical right eh. Wala eh. We're talking here about what, what is right. Mm -hmm. The rule of law. Following the international law. Try and validate it then, Ambassador. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> but they keep uh, harping on it. Well, wala tayong magagawa. I mean, they're, they're, that's what you call, uh, there's always somebody in the neighborhood who will be trying to bully uh, smaller countries. Mm. Pero pag magsama-sama tayong lahat, uh, I, I think uh, the message is clear. Ano palang update, Ambassador, dun sa purchase natin ng F-16? So the last time we talked, diba, you said that most likely it's a third party. Well, that is what we're trying to push because uh, yung procurement law is our problem right now. Eh. Kasi in the procurement law, which even uh, covers uh, any procurement from for our armed forces, they have to buy brand new. Pero... That is really an aspiration, eh. you know, an F-16, a brand new F-16. Eh, siguro, ang mabibili natin yan, dalawa, mm -hmm. with the kind of budget that we have. But if we go to a third country, where it, uh, the F-16s are, they're now changing into the higher model, which yeah. is probably the F-35. So these are very good F-16s that the United States is uh, uh, working with us. We can get a dozen of that with the kind of budget that we have. Two versus Plus 12. Tutulung, yes. Mm -hmm. Tutulungan pa tayo ng, uh, uh, ng United States and be able to uh, to finance the purchase of that. So, that is what, that, that's why doon tayo naka, naka na stop ngayon eh. We, we, have to, we have to really uh, re, redo our procurement law mm -hmm. so that we'll be able to afford to buy 
good equipment that is going to be useful for us. But is that uh, in the works now? Well, I, when the last time I spoke to Senator uh, uh, Senate President uh, Big Subiri, he said that he already had, uh, they've already filed a resolution. It's going to go through a committee of some sort. And then after that, they're going to discuss it in the plenary. And hopefully, they can change that uh, as soon as possible. What is the target, niya, sir? Yung sariling time frame niya in terms of procuring this dozen of, uh, well, dozen of F-16s? Well, uh, we don't even know whether the, the dozen F-16s are still available. But we can definitely, if we, if, we, if, we, if we tweak our procurement laws into such a way that it is going to be more uh, affordable for us to be able to buy many of the equipment that we'd like to have, then I think we, that's, that's, that's already a good start. Because uh, the modernization doesn't mean we need to buy the best and the most expensive at, uh, at brand new prices. Mm -hmm. We can buy all of these things at, the, at the reasonable prices so that the maintenance and the, com and the continuing uh, process of upgrading them, you know, it's like you buy a camera, you can upgrade it. So, so same thing with an aircraft like the F-16. The, the F-16s have been around for a long time, mm -hmm. but they can upgrade it in such a way that it would be considered to be brand new, but it's it, the uh, avionics and all the uh, peripheralia that goes with it it can be uh, upgraded. Kaya kailangan natin palitan yung procurement law natin. So I suppose meron naman po yung ano, no? parang specs coming from the Philippines. Yes, of course. Pero so, hindi naman ganito yung sobrang tagal na siya nagamit or laspag na. Hindi, hindi. Iba, iba itong uh, ginagawa natin ngayon eh. Yung, like for instance, yung mga helicopter na binibigay sa atin noon, uh, most of that is no longer uh, available. What we're doing now is like, like, like now, we bought this... Uh, Ito mga Sikorsky helicopters mm -hmm. that was uh, delivered to us. We're getting about 30 plus of that one. All of those are already uh, considered brand new helicopters that is now being used by our uh, by our armed forces. So we, we the same thing with all of these fighter jets that we're trying to get. Mm -hmm. It would be very uh, effective for us because, uh, especially because of our territorial water, we have 7,600 islands. We need something like that. In terms of, ano, ambassador, <coughs> I forgot the figure, pero meron mm -hmm. tayong figure doon sa hardware support coming from the U.S., no? I think mm -hmm. from 2015 to 2022. <coughs> yeah. How much is that? I forgot the, the term. Eh. Pero how much are we expecting in the coming years? Oh, well, I can't say the exact figure, but all I can tell you is that over the past, since 2015, uh, we have uh, received a total of close to $700 million to $800 million worth of uh, equipment, uh, training, and mm. all of these things. These are all costed out. And uh, we can expect more down the road, obviously. But all of that is because we have to program it. Hindi naman pwede yung we just make a wish list or bigyan sa amin lahat ito. Kailangan, ano eh, kailangan yung nakaprograma eh. Because it also, hindi, porket meron, nandyan yung equipment. You know, for instance, itong, just to give you an example, itong F-16. Kailangan may training yan. Eh. There's a three to three to six month training for our pilots to be able to to maneuver those aircrafts and make it really uh, effective. Mm -hmm. Hindi pwede yung just because you're a pilot, eh, you can just go into the cockpit and you fly the aircraft. <laughs> Hindi ganun yun. Eh. <laughs> no, no. An example of that. Remember what happened to Ukraine? They've been asking for this aircraft. Yeah. It takes time for the pilots to to yeah. train to be able to use it. You remember the maneuverability of these uh, fighter jets is, is totally different from a regular jet. Mm -hmm. So so these things have to be programmed. Kasama mm -hmm. dyan yung mga, in terms of support, the mga drones and other equipment from... Well, there's a lot of that, of course, mm -hmm. of course yung mga ganyan. The surveillance equipment, we've been getting quite a bit of that already right now. Kaya real-time yung ating mga, yung mga ginagawa natin yung surveillance, not only in, in, in our territorial waters, but even also in in uh, in the inland where we, we still have... Uh, areas where there's some conflict. So we have we use a lot of uh, surveillance equipment that was supplied to us not only by the United States, but other countries as well. Israel is one other country that has been very effectively uh, giving us a lot of equipment. I mean, our procurement with uh, Israel has been quite uh, quite good. So we have a better view or vision of what's happening, for instance, oh, in the yes. Philippine Sea. Absolutely. And we're working together with the United States. So mm -hmm. in other words, our our uh, surveillance is now real time. Hindi yung this happened two days ago. Ngayon nakikita na natin lahat everything that's happening. How about yung other front? Kasi de ba merong obvious harassment, physical coming from China. How about the other uh, more problematic aspect of this uh, war, which is propaganda or in Chinese influence operations, mm -hmm. 
Are we also coordinating, cooperating with the U.S. and other allies regarding this? Well, on the cyber crime, that's basically under the cyber uh, security. We, we definitely are working with many countries now, more than ever, because that's where they are trying to uh, hack into our system. And then they twist it and make it appear as if it's, it's something else. Mm. So, and then, of course, this information is, is a natural consequence of that. Mm. So we're, we're working closely with a lot of other countries. Pero meron bang ano dyan? Parang clear strategy or blueprint? And about the strategy that we, we, we have already put together is something that uh, has, been, uh, has been there for some time. What we did now is to be able to expand it more now, including other countries. It's very important for us to understand that like what's happening right now in Ukraine, for instance, Ukraine will not be able to stand up to what, uh, the, or what's happening there with the aggression from Russia if they did not have NATO. Mm. But they were, at that time, they were not as prepared as they are today. Mm. But the support that they're getting from the, uh, for, from the uh, NATO countries is, is, is what making Ukraine strong the way it is. I'm not saying it's the same model, but it can be the similar situation with us and other countries as well. So we need to have a multilateral approach to all the things that we do on the defense strategy. Hindi naman kailangang military alliance, eh, no? Kumbaga, well, ano it, it, is a, it is an alliance that will, that nagkakaintindihan tayo, like especially uh, Australia and Japan, because they, they, they're feeling it also. Yes. They know that anything happens to us, it will affect them. Mm. And this is what the other ASEAN countries must understand also. Now, he, you, you cannot be immune from this, eh. But is that also translated into fighting Chinese influence operations? Whatever it takes to be able to set the record straight, for lack of any other word to say. We just want to make sure that whatever information goes out there is the accurate information. You cannot fool around with a surveillance uh, video that shows exactly the aggression that's taking place. You can say anything you want, but the video says it all. Mm. So that, that, that's what we're doing right now. That's what we call transparency uh, initiative, initiative yeah. that our, uh, our uh, PCG, our Philippine Coast Guard, is, is doing right now. The National Task Force on the West Philippines. Exactly. I think that's a strategy, no? Yes. So it's a whole-of-government approach. Whole-of-government approach, which is very important, definitely. I asked you, Ambassador, because you were also in Washington uh, during the Duterte administration. I've been observing your... Your pronouncements. Mukabo mas may breath of fresh air ngayon. You can speak more freely about what is right in the West Philippine Sea. Well, let's put it this way. Uh, you know, being an ambassador and you're appointed, of course, by the president, you follow what the, his thinking is. Yes. So uh, my understanding of the thinking of then President Duterte was we want to approach this whole problem with China in a different way, which is basically to continue to talk to them. Remember, there was no communication after we filed the, yeah. the case in the, in the UNCLOS. No? So there was, there was no high-level communication with China. So President Duterte changed the tact. So he wanted to approach China and let's talk about it. Let's allow things, let's allow our fishermen. Yeah. Yes, to, to bring it. And perhaps at that time, it, it was fine. It was something that we wanted, that uh, peaceful coexistence. But then, continues pa rin yung, yung, ano, yung, uh, yung claim nila that they own this area. And remember, from 9, naging 10, naging 11 dash line. So medyo, yan ang pwede natin sabihin, teka, teka muna. Hindi yata ganyan ang usapan natin. I mean, you know, you have to respect whatever uh, our territory is, which is, given to us by the by the arbitral award. So dun, dun tayo mag, that's where we're starting with now with President Marcos. He, his pronouncement is we will not give up one inch, yeah. one square inch of our territory, which is correct yeah. because it's in our constitution. Mm. The President of the Republic of the Philippines is compelled to protect the interests of the Philippines and protect our shores our territory. If he does otherwise, he is uh, liable constitutionally. Did you feel a certain frustration on time na yun, that you, could talk, you couldn't talk about these things? Alam mo, not really. Sa totoo lang, uh, you know, when you're a diplomat, you try to, as best as you can, to try to interpret uh, what the foreign policy of the president is 
who is the chief uh, architect. architect. So you, you interpret it in such a way that your hosts, which is the United States, uh, would, would understand what we're trying to do. And to a certain extent, the only problem really was when we started to, uh, well, when President Duterte uh, abrogated the visiting forces agreement. Yes. That's a big thing for the United States because that's very important in their whole strategy also. And then Edgar was in trouble. And of course, Edgar also was in trouble. So you and Major, that, that's really, I would say that that's probably one of the challenging times. But you know, maybe it's an act of God. The corona pandemic. Mm. The pandemic was something that uh, nobody expected. And we needed to work with a country like the United States, who obviously had the, the kind of vaccines that uh, was needed for our people. You know, it was, so many people were dying of the pandemic. So I had to tell the president that we need to work with our ally to be able to be given a at least first Kasi eh, you've got 200 plus countries who want the same thing. Mm. Eh, siyempre, pag magkaibigan kayo, hindi eh, uunahin nila yung mga kanilang allies. So medyo na wala, eh, tayo, medyo na wala tayo ng konti doon. Kailangan tayo bumalik sa, sa linya. Na, na, nahirapan ba kayo? Bumalik sa linya? Eh, to a certain extent, medyo ano na, sa totoo lang, uh, I, I mean, I don't want to really make a big thing out of it, but I, I, I had a challenge. I had to go to the White House. I practically had to beg with them to to help us because, uh, for, alam mo, marami tayong mga kaibigan that were calling, kailan ba tayong magkakaroon ng vaccine? Because everybody was uh, waiting for it. Kaya nga, nawala sa atin yung 10 million, if you remember mm -hmm. that Pfizer, that was being given to us in the beginning, but for some reason, hindi natin tinuloy yun. So nawala sa atin, nakuha ng Singapore. Eh, medyo, siyempre, at saka, meron ako isang kaibigan, sabi niya, kung dumating yung Pfizer, hindi na matay yung kapatid ko. Uh -huh. So, medyo, siyempre, may emotional feeling din tayo noon. Uh, we're feeling bad about it. So, talagang, I, I really had to tell our friends in the United States that tulungan ninyo kami because this will go a long way. We need your help at this time because it's our people already that are suffering. At sinabi ko kay Presidente, sabi ko sa kanya, kay President Duterte, Sir, kailangan natin uh, to work with them. In not so many words. Balik na natin yung PFA. At... Uh, Yun ang hiningi ng US. Well, hindi naman in, in natin na direct way. They will never tell you, we'll give, you give us this, you'll give you that. Hindi quid pro quo. But, but yeah. there, there's, there's always that. I mean, that's that's the reality of life. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Kumbaga alam niya na? <coughs> Basically, yes. Mm. And yung, when you had to quote-unquote beg uh, the White House, how long before things was uh, things were smooth? Uh, no, well, I think, look, in fairness to President Duterte, he acted immediately because he knew that it's important for our people to get those vaccines. So the sooner we, we signed up, the better for us. Ito rin ba yung time, Ambassador, na medyo parang naglilo si President Duterte sa mga banat niya sa US? Well, probably that could have been the reason why. Eh, alam mo, alam mo, pag ganyan ang situation natin, namamatay yung mga tao, eh, wala ka nang, hindi mo na iisipin yung ano bang makukuha natin, o ano, or is it, Ano ba, are we getting any arms that we need? Hindi na eh. Buhay na pinag-uusapan natin eh. So, I think it was, he understood very clearly is uh, the United States is one of the main uh, uh, suppliers for this, this important vaccine, uh, which is not available anywhere else except to the U.S. and to other European countries. We had to, we had to, we had to get it. The initial challenge, uh, Ambassador, when the president, then President Duterte spoke in China, di ba? Mm -hmm. Parang sabi niya, alis na kami sa US, pupunta kami sa fold niyo. I mean, how, how difficult was it for you to to communicate or explain that with your hosts? Well, I did not have to explain anything. The fact of the matter is they understood that President Duterte had his feelings towards the United States. They, they felt that way. And so they accepted it. Uh, my, my job was, uh, as the president told me, just do your job. So I... I I, I uh, understood that to mean that I'll do my best to be able to assure our friends in the United States that the relationship continues no matter what. We will do our best to be able to uh, to come out to a situation where our friendship uh, will remain even if we're trying to reach out as, as our policy then was friends to all and enemies to none. Mm. Eh, pero hindi naman tayo naghahanap ng enemy. Tayo yung ginagawa ng enemy. So I think now, uh, very clearly, there's no question about it, and everybody understands uh, understands mm -hmm. that uh, 
the enemy is one that is being aggressive. If you stop being aggressive, then you are a threat. Mm. Ngayon naman, uh, fast forward 2024, di ba? When, when President Marcos assumed office in 2022, marami rin nagulat eh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Because they thought he would continue the policy toward China by mm-hmm. President Duterte. It turned out ibang-iba. And this is the right policy. Absolutely. Pero ang banat naman sa kanya ng mga pro-Duterte forces, especially online, sinasabi, ano bang gusto nito? Gera. Hmm. Parang dinadala tayo sa gera. I mean, how do you, commu- how do you respond to that narrative? I think that that is a, that is a complete misnomer because, you know, uh, I know President Marcos very well. Uh, kung meron man makakaroon ng hinanakit sa Amerika, it is the Marcos family because of what happened in the past. But very clear from the very beginning, sinabi na sa akin ni President Marcos uh, Jr. that I am not going to make decisions based on my personal feelings. It will be based on what I feel is for the good of the country and our national interest. And that's exactly what he's doing right now. And he is doing the right thing. And, you know, I, I'm not saying this because I'm, I'm, I'm his ambassador. I'm saying this because this is what the international community is saying. He is the most, uh, I would say, in the top five or top ten of leaders that are now highly respected all over the world. To President Marcos? President Marcos. Because of what? Because of what he's doing right now. Standing up to what is correct and what is right. How about yung baggage ng family history? The, you know, the baggage is something that is it's a question of interpretation. Uh, para sa akin, you know. I even told him, I always, I always tell people, President Marcos Jr. is not there to, 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 uh, to uh, rewrite history. He is writing history by himself. What he is doing is doing good for the country and doing good for the world, in my opinion. And many people are saying the same thing. So he's not rewriting the... He's not rewriting what... That, that's, what happened. that's up to people who want to, to interpret what history is all about. What you're doing is what you're making history right now. That's what's important. You see? Rewriting history is something that is... As, as President Nixon, uh, President Nixon said, once said, history is written by those who won. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. They, 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 they write history. But history is written also by those that are living it. Nung anong bala sa, nung, di ba before the results of the 2022 elections, mm-hmm. syempre, minamonitor yan ng mga bansa, no? including mm-hmm. Washington. In your conversations, how, was it a pronounced issue? Yung ill-gotten wealth issue dun sa leading candidate? Or even after he won? What do you mean? Yung... Was it a concern for the Americans? The main concern for the Americans was what exactly his policy would be. And uh, so I told him exactly what the president said. I am not going to make decisions based on my personal feelings. It will be based on what I think is best for the country. And that's exactly what he's doing. Ambassador. I know you have a, another appointment. But in terms of um, making up for lost time, I was asking to talk about what I Because six years were not easy mm-hmm. in terms of handling the China question and also dealing with the United States. Mahirap ba ngayon na you have to make up for those six years of appeasement, which well, didn't exactly work. Hindi naman. I, I, like I said, you know, in, in diplomacy, you always try everything that you can. And the most important thing is you try to keep the peace. Diplomacy will only work if you... Uh, you make sure that there will be no conflict, yeah. armed conflict. So that is where we are. We're using every means that we have in our diplomatic arsenal to be able to find ways and means to be able to keep the peace in our region. That is all what we're doing right now. That is what I did in the past. That's what I am doing right now. And that's what I will continue to do so for as long as the president wants me to serve as his ambassador to Washington, D.C. Siguro, as a final word, no? um, can you speak with the ordinary Filipinos as to how important this fight for the West Philippines is, especially in the face of massive Chinese disinformation online? Well, all I can tell our, our, our people is that uh, we're facing very serious challenges today. We need to be together because at the end of the day, Not naman tayo, we just want to be able to have our peace, uh, the peace and stability in our region. And most importantly, yung mga fishermen natin who feed us, uh, they must be able to continue what they've been doing for hundreds of years. 
yun lang naman ang atin eh. Hindi naman tayo, we're not trying to hunger to be able to expand our territory or anything like that. We are just protecting what is ours and we have to be united in that. And I, I'm, I'm very confident that 90% of our people understand this very well. And they know that what we're doing is the right thing. And we will continue to do so uh, to protect our, our people and our country. Ambassador Bibram Waldes, thank you very much for joining us. It's thank you also, Christian. Very nice to see you. And uh, congratulations in your program. Salamat. Yan po, si Ambassador Bibram Waldes, nakasama po natin sa ating Fox First Convo. Uh, marami marami salamat po for joining us today.